Yo, what up, fam? Welcome back to another episode of Scientifically Proven at this point. Number one podcast in the world for digital agencies. And as you know, mainstream media says you can't question science. And so because it is scientifically proven, we are number one in the world. And we are number one for the reason that I bring on badass guests. And also our Friday segment happens to be popping, which is Sales in the Rocks. So if you guys have not checked out Sales in the Rocks yet, please go and do so. As always, my name is Joey Gilkey, CEO of Sales Driven Agency, your fearless leader here on the Best Damn Agency podcast, and the founder of the Best Damn Agency Mastermind, the number one exclusive community for digital agency owners who are doing seven or eight figures. So as I said, in order for us to stay number one, I got to bring on some badass players in the agency space, and no different is today than my guest, Tim Warren of Helium SEO. My man, Tim. What's up, brother? What's going on, man? How are you? I am good. Thank you for coming on. We, uh, we've we had a couple conversations at this point. We share some common interests, one being sales, specifically for agencies, which we'll get into, the other being cars and uh, spending our money oh, yeah. on expensive shit like cars and RVs and all the fun stuff that comes with. For me, I'm a redneck in East Tennessee, so I kind of have a, a rite of passage, if you will, to own big expensive trucks and shit like that. But I don't know your background specifically, how you got and all that stuff. So we'll get into that. But Tim, you're on the Best Name Agency podcast. So for one, congrats and thank you. But two, let the people know a little bit about you, a little bit about Helium, what you guys do, what, what market you kind of serve, and then uh, let's dive in. Yeah, totally. So uh, my name's Tim Warren. I've been a serial entrepreneur. I've got a weird background. So I was a med student in med school at Ohio U. Uh, started looking at the life of surgeons who were going in and out of the hospital, you know, 15, 20 hour days. They control your schedule. And I said, man, I don't really want that for my future. So I quit and became an entrepreneur. It's kind of the very short version of that and got into marketing, advertising, fell into the world of SEO. And I've been doing SEO now for 10 years. So I've started multiple companies. Uh, some have been very successful. Some have not as, as <laughs> happens with entrepreneurship, right? Uh, you yep. learn. You probably learn more from the failures than the successes, honestly. Or honestly, um, I am married. I've got two kids and one on the way. Uh, I have, like you, have mastered the art of turning money into sound um, by buying expensive cars. Uh, it's a it's an art, a skill. It is. Uh, you take the dollars and you create uh, sound out of the back of engines. Um, but it's, it's <laughs> kind of fun, man. So, so we live in we live in Cincinnati. So we're kind of Southern Ohio. Um, I grew up kind of a city slicker, honestly, you know, like not, not super into nature, camping, whatever, but my wife is South African. My father-in-law owns a, uh, you know, a farm and a software company he kind of did them both. So I've learned over the years to enjoy camping, RVing, motorcycles, four wheelers, like anything that, that, that revs and goes. Yep. Still don't do horses though, man. Like, I don't know, horses freak me out. I'd rather there be a kill switch on the engine. Like if that horse just wants to gallop and chuck you, it yeah, will. You don't have so, a, uh, uh, you have no control. You have no control. But on an engine, it's like, oh, I, I screwed up this four wheeler. I, I feel all figured out. With a horse, it's like, <laughs> oh, it might just want to kill me. So That's right. I like going fast on stuff, but not on horses. Although I did get a gnarly ATV or UTV wreck a few weeks ago. And uh, I wish there was a that. kill switch that would have kept it from doing a barrel roll down the highway. But I don't have a helmet on? Nope. Well, that's your problem, man. You had a helmet, you did fine. I know. I wouldn't have broken my ankle, tailbone, scapula. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would have still broken those, but I wouldn't have gotten this massive ass scar, which you can't really see right now on the camera. But yeah, you, would, you would have not gotten that scar. But yeah, you probably would still broken the other stuff. Whatever. Yeah, but happens, you know, man. listen, I told my wife I'd wear a helmet from now on. Although we have our mastermind anti retreats, what we call them, because I don't believe in calling it a retreat. We're not retreating from anything in life. We're just changing the context to get better at the things of life. Yeah. And, uh, we're going to Scottsdale, Arizona with the, with the the full mastermind. So we're all showing up and doing all this fun shit. But the last day, we're doing a six-hour UTV tour through the desert. Nice. I told my wife I'd wear a helmet. I am probably should honor that. But uh, it's hot as shit in the desert. So we'll see how we're doing. We'll see how crazy I'm going to get. So we actually just – we were just in Scottsdale this summer, and we did that exact trip. We oh, really? In the middle of the desert. Yeah. The blast? Yeah, yeah. We, we – it was tons of fun. It was super hot. Um, yeah. And they, I'll, I'll say this, the group that we went with, because like we hired a company to like take our family out or whatever, because yep. they bring the ATVs of it. Like they're, they were pretty strict about, they made you wear a helmet. They made you wear the bandana. By the end, you wanted to, because it was so dusty. Um, 
but I'm pretty sure if you don't wear your helmet, the guy won't let you go because of insurance. Fair enough. So well, you might have to honor it anyway. Yeah, I'm going to have we'll to. Anyways. I would have done it anyways, babe. You don't listen to my podcast, but if you did, I got to at least cover my ass. <laughs> don't worry. I, I, won't, I won't tell her. I yeah. Won't tell her um, no, it is the honorable we'll thing to do. On the podcast, stays on the podcast. <laughs> what happens on the podcast stays on the podcast. That's right. So it's time about helium. So do you guys have a specific niche? Um, we do. So, so helium is a tech enabled, uh, service company. So what we do is we started by building artificial intelligence and machine learning tools for the SEO space. Um, our goal was to disrupt and really, we, we wanted to come into a space that was very fragmented, very difficult. A lot of companies have struggled with finding a good SEO provider, figuring out their own SEO. It's a difficult space, right? I mean, you serve agencies or sales teams. There's a ton of companies that, you know, just as just like the Shrugged Adult sales team are very struggling to, to figure out inbound marketing and yeah. SEO and SEM. They think they're doing the right stuff. They're not. They're not seeing results. They're churning agencies. So we kind of entered that fray in 2017. I had just sold another agency. And our goal at Helium was always, number one, we wanted to be the best at what we did. So we, we've been always very, very niche. We're very focused, right? Pick a niche and get rich. So it's been SEO for midsize and enterprise companies. Um, we do paid search and we do CRO. So it's, it's kind of that inbound marketing for mid-sized and enterprise focused all around search, only search. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's our niche. We don't only do one or two industries because we're such a focused provider in those, yeah. those few services. You know, we work from Honeywell to PetSmart, B2B to B2C, enterprise or e-com to non-e-com. We could do them all, um, although I would say the biggest companies tend to be B2B e-commerce or B2C e-commerce companies because yeah. they spend the most on digital marketing. Um, but about half our business is B2B. So there's a lot of B2B companies that are really trying to enter the digital space in a big way um, and and drive more through online marketing. Yeah. Because consumers, you know, the more and more we use Amazon and you know, one-click shipping, the more even B2B buyers are being traditioned, you know, we're, we're being conditioned to want to go to the web and find information. and get our questions answered without calling and talking to a salesperson. So we're, we're seeing that shift. Um, but in terms of uh, industry specialty, we do not have uh, Helium. We started in, in uh, late 2017, early 2018. Uh, we didn't raise any funding. Uh, and we're about 60 employees now spread out over uh, four offices across the U.S. So nice. we grow fast. That's all W-2? Yeah, so we do primarily full-time. We have some part-time people like content yeah. writers and interns and stuff like that. Uh, but primarily full-time people in the U.S. Um, you know, we we don't really use contractors that often. We can, but for us, it's all about quality. Yeah. Um, so there, there's sometimes we can use contractors if it's for very like you know mundane and routine tasks like reviewing metadata or things like that. Sure. But most of our work is done by full-time W two employees here in the U.S. So it sounds like you have learned uh, you get what you pay for at yeah. some point. You know, my I mom think- taught me that lesson as a kid, right? Get what you pay for. It's true, man. I think that's, and for those who are listening, I think it's such a, for, for some reason, agencies, I think there is a tipping point where you learn this lesson. And if you haven't yet learned it, you'll realize you do get what you pay for. I think a lot of us try to cut corners. And I think we also realize like what got us here, or we don't realize this, what got us here won't get us there. And so what we don't often think about, and you guys have scaled quickly, right? You started 2017, 2018. And you're already up to 60 employees. You guys are obviously doing good revenue just based on what I know about our conversations. Like at some point, at certain revenue levels, at certain benchmarks, we have to start top filling our our agency with better talent in order for us to keep up with the demand of the market. And I think a lot of us try to to make the people that got us here work for what's going to get us there. Correct me if I'm wrong. Has that been your experience as well? Yeah. So there's... um... You know, and I, I don't know exactly who the who's listening to the podcast, but um, typically when you think about venture backed and fast growing companies, right? Now we didn't we didn't raise any, any any venture on purpose because we wanted to maintain control of the company and be able to to guide the future and not yep. be in a fund that's going to end in three years. And so it's quick, grow as fast as you can, and then we're going to try to liquidate you, right? Yeah, we want to avoid that. Um, but regardless of that, my CEO coach, I, I I'm coached by again Cameron Harold, so he was the the COO of One Eight Hundred Got Junk from. 2 million in revenue to 106. Hmm. And they did that in six years, right? Now they were a franchise. So still, that's still really fast growth. But a franchise, you get a lot of owners so you can grow more quickly, right? Because you can scale really quickly. But that's still really, really fast growth. And so he has told me this, but over the years, I've heard this from multiple other people as well. Your company 
every time you double in size and there are certain milestones where your company, probably a lot of the people will turn over. And it's not because the people are bad. It's because some people love million dollar companies where they wear 12 hats and they love that. Other people hate that and they want to work in a hundred million dollar company where they're super specialist in one little thing, right? Um, what I've heard, Joey, are the milestones are basically from 1 million to 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, and 100 million. Mm-hmm. There could be a, a 30 million in there as well. A lot of your company, not everybody, but a lot of people in your company will either change roles or leave or turn over because you need different people at yeah. those different levels. Um, and so it's very rare. And I, I taught my founders this. Uh, it's very rare for someone who starts at the business at, at zero to make it to 100 million. Yeah. Because you have to be super adaptable. You have to be super intelligent. And then I think the piece that's missing in a lot of cases is awareness. The awareness to look at yourself honestly and say, what do I actually have? What am I good at? What am I bad at? What am I willing to stop doing? Where can I double down and grow? And a lot of people are afraid to do that. They're afraid to have an honest look in the mirror, like how much weight did I really gain over the holidays? They want to kind of ignore it. And that does not get you through the next stages of your company. So if you're a good marketing person at 5 million and your company goes to 10, you better start to understand what you are really good and not good at. And if you need to become a manager and you suck at managing people, you can't just ignore that and hope it goes away. Yep. Now, I think too, the, and the point you made there, that I think the phrase that rings in my head is effort and sacrifice, right? Like yeah, effort is, is typically what do I need to add that I do not currently have? What, what do I need to take on my shoulders that I currently do not? Sacrifice is what do I need to stop doing that I am currently doing? And I think that oftentimes we, we focus more on the efforts thing of what can I add? Who can I hire? What vendor can I make? You know, bring in? How do I do this thing? And, and sometimes some of the, the key to unlocking growth is actually stop doing some of the things that you are doing. And that's the sacrifice portion. And um, even, even to like just to riff on that. So, so we have a sales team, we have five to six full-time salespeople and, and my background is kind of sales chief revenue officer. So I always, from day one for the company said, well, I'm going to be in sales. I'm going to manage a sales team. Maybe not forever, but I will for now. Right. Cause I know our product, I know our TAM, I know our, our go to market. I know a good and bad client and I know our industry. I know our product really well yep. I've been doing this for 10 years. So there's no one I couldn't theoretically sell to. So I was like, yeah, this makes a good fit. And I didn't want to hire a guy from the outside who, who's going to come in, can't spell SEO, but knows sales management really well, right? Because I feel like my current team, who are all pretty veteran now, you know, they've been here since we started the company, a lot of them, they know our product really well. So the guy comes in and doesn't know it, like they're not going to go to him with their problems, right? right? So I'm trying to avoid this. But now that we've gotten, you know, that as we're, as we're really, you know, 50, 60 employees and we're, you know, you know, 15, 20 million is our next milestone to hit revenue wise, we're kind of getting to this level now where it's like, ah, frick. I can't manage the sales team and be the CEO anymore. So that's that's something that I've been doing that I have to stop doing. I need to bring in somebody who's better at it than me, right? I'm okay at it. I'm like, great. But there are sales managers who are really freaking good at managing people and they're better than me. And so I need to look at that and say, I'm a mediocre sales manager at best, but I'm a good CEO. So let me go be a CEO and stop doing what I'm mediocre at. So that goes back to that awareness, right? You got to be willing to look at that and be like, mm, I'm only okay at this. I'm really good at this. Let yeah. me double down on what I'm great at. And then let me bring someone in to, to fill in where I'm only okay. Um, so that, that's a difficult part. I think a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's, it's not, it's decisions you can't make a ton in advance. Like, hey, when are you going to stop doing marketing and have a CMO? Not sure exactly, but probably at 25 million. You know, and you kind of have those ideas, but then you need to be able to, to figure it out as you go and realize, we got to take this department to the next level. We're going to need to bring in someone from the outside who has knowledge we don't have, skills yeah. we don't have. And that's why you eventually have to grow from the outside because there's only so much you know, right? Yeah, and I think there's also the the flip side of the coin, which is making that decision too early. Right? I see it all the time where an agency thinks they need a VP of sales, a CRO, a director of sales, et cetera. And in all actuality, they're just not there yet. They don't actually need that. They just think they do because they don't want to have it on their plate. Um, but it oftentimes, if if sales management is structured correctly for a founder, CEO, owner, there are frameworks in place that can enable you to be extremely effective and extremely efficient and not require all that much time from you, the owner, to still be an incredible sales leader. 
um, with not as much time invested. And so I think that some people just decide, oh, I need to go find the $180,000 base salary, $300,000 on target earnings for the year person to come manage your sales department of three, four, five people. And, and I don't think they're quite ready yet. Um, mm -hmm. But they're going to make that mistake. And I say mistake, sometimes it works out great. Um, but I think it's just maybe the, the least efficient way of going about doing it. So that's that's my two cents. And I digress a little bit. Talk, talk to me a little bit about why you chose. I love this conversation because there's very few agency owners that come on who truly understand sales as it relates mm -hmm. to growth. Um, they get it from a referrals and inbound perspective, right? Where it's like, hey, you know, my network feeds this and I can I have to sell them to get the deal done. But that's not sales we're talking about. We're talking about hardcore sales yep. operation, process, people, enablement, technology, training, management, leadership, all the things that go into sales ops. And it's also including things like outbound sales, not just inbound or referral and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So why'd you choose sales? Why'd you choose sales to scale to where you guys are heading to now, which is your next benchmark, 15, 20 million? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, a couple, a couple things. So I grew up in large multi-billion dollar marketing organizations, right? Lamar Outdoor Advertising, you know, Yellow Book, these companies. I mean, when I worked at Yellow Book, man, I had 6,000 salespeople. And it was just pound the pavement itself. Yep. And what I saw in these big organizations, Lamar was 2 billion, Yellow Book was 6 or 10 billion. Or, no, maybe they were 2, 3 billion, somewhere in that ballpark. These are big marketing organizations that have sold a lot of deals on the back of a lot of salespeople making a lot of cold calls. Yep. Right. What I learned pretty early on is marketing won't sell itself. Um, you, you cannot build the best mousetrap and people beat a door down, you know, to get it. Right. Right. Okay. In the case of Tesla, right, you have a very unique eccentric founder who's built amazing products, and there's all this whole ethos in Silicon Valley of like it's a it's a badge of honor not to sell in market. Mm -hmm. You have such good product, people will come to you. I think in a few cases that can somewhat be there, but he even markets because he's super active on Twitter and all the antics that he has is marketing essentially, right? That's right. Um, it's kind of like Donald Trump, right? Love him or hate him. The guy got in front of people like crazy because all the stuff he was saying, he'd get on the news, people heard about him. It, you know, it's marketing, um, it good or bad. For most companies, 95% of the companies out there, you have to sell your product if you want to get in front of people. You're not going to have a brand that people have heard of. You're not going to have some product that's so amazing, like a Tesla, you know, or SpaceX, that everyone's yeah. going to use it. Because the guy's like a literal genius, right? You're probably not going to have that in most cases. So you're going to have to go get your product in front of people. What I always saw, Joey, is you probably see this all the time. Agency owners who don't have sales teams, their agencies cap out at about two to three million dollars a year, and they never exactly. get bigger. They never know why they get they don't get bigger, but it's because that's their own personal aura. They can no longer scale their own ability past that level because they are still managing and keeping their big clients happy. They're still selling the deals and they have a mental block that says no one can sell this product as well as me. Yep. So they try to hire salespeople. What they do is they'll hire one director of biz dev. They'll give the guy six months. He doesn't catch on to what they do in six months and they fire and move on. And then they said, I tried it once and said, didn't work. I tried to build a sales team. It didn't work. And so well, I never wanted that, right? That was the first thing. So I, I built backwards from what I didn't want. Number two is our, we've always built our company like a SaaS company. I mean, we, we built custom software. You know, we, we have engineers. We develop software, but we sell as a tech enabled service because the market had a lot of SEO SaaS products. It didn't have really good SEO service providers. So that's why we said, let's use our, our software and sell as a service. And maybe we can dominate in that space. And, and that has been, you know, really has paid off for us. We've always thought like a SaaS company. SaaS companies, they have great demos. They have good sales systems. They have sales tech stacks. They build sales teams with sales commission plans and good management. They scale their product using sales, right? They scale their company. So I've always focused on that. Um, not thought of us like an agency. So that, that's kind of two of the reasons. I guess what I didn't want was to get stuck at $3 million because we didn't have a sales team and that was as much as I could manage. Yep. And, and I also wanted to have a sales team of 50 people who are doing all of the sales, right? Not the ownership team and truly can scale like a software company. Mm. Um, so those, that's why we decided to go that direction. I love that too. And, and there's two things that you had mentioned that, that I always harp on because literally what you just said is part of my, my pitch most of the time, right? For sales driven agency is, is most agencies, we usually say the same thing. It's about between two and three and a half. 
is you will hit a plateau. If you have not hit it today, you will, will hit it at some point. And even then, if you get that two to three and a half, you're really fucking good at what you do. Right? Like that totally. is totally. right. And, and so if you're not really fucking good at what you do, you're not going to get there even. So um, no. I, I'd encourage you not to be in business. But um, if you are, you're, you're, you might be good at what you do. And it's word of mouth and referrals and network and things like that that drive you to that three million top. Um, the other reason why I think that people can't get past that and they can't bring on a build a sales operation, bring on salespeople, bring on a director of biz dev, which I never suggest bringing on a director of biz dev as your first sales hire ever, ever, ever. Um, it should be salespeople and I have my reasons for that. But a lot of people don't know how to hand off sales, like you said, because they don't think anyone can do it as good as them. But the other reason is because you have grown far more organically through referrals and being good at what you do in word of mouth, mm -hmm. you don't have predictability around lead generation. You don't have predictability around how many deals you're going to get in front of this month, next month, the month after that. And because of that, and you have no predictability. You have no way of forecasting what it's going to look like. So every deal has that much more weight to it. And in your mind, you can't relinquish control of the few deals you have because you know that you have a higher close rate because you're the owner and the one being referred to than your salesperson. So you get in this trap of knowing or thinking you can't hand off sales because it's not going to be done as good as you. And mm -hmm. the leads have a ton of weight to them because you have no predictability around your lead gen. Um, and the second part is you don't know how to set salespeople up for success. So I want to dive into that here in a minute too of what it looks like to actually set salespeople up for success. Because a lot of times people think I pay you salary, you bring me back deals, you get commission. That's like, that's the extent of their sales training and expectations for the salesperson. Here's a, here's a phone. Here's a computer. Yeah. Good luck champ. Phone, Go computer. Get. Here's who I want to work with. Yeah. Here's what we sell. Yeah. I pay you salary. You bring me back deals. It'll be a great engagement. Out. Right. Hey, do you have any contact data? No. No, 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 no. Go figure that out. Build your list. Nah, figure that out. Google it. Figure it out. I see it all the time. And I want to dive into that. But before I do that, I got to talk about my mastermind. So those of you guys who listen, you guys know I run the number one exclusive community for seven and eight figure digital agencies who want to build the best damn agency they possibly can. Um, and so for those who are the players in the space and they realize that they're not going to do this alone, they want to be around other people who are also accomplishing this, who are going to challenge them, who are going to help them cut corners, um, help them solve problems that maybe other people have already solved. And you're, you're speeding up uh, the rate at which you can grow because you're getting people who've already done it around you. That is the best damn agency mastermind. It is an exclusive community. I only let a certain type of person in there. So one, if you're an asshole, you're not coming in. Two, if you're a leech and you're not a giver, you're not coming in. Three, if you aren't actually pursuing excellence in what you do in your craft, and you're not willing to be humble around other guys and girls who want to help you grow, then it's not for you. Uh, we do have a gauntlet after the application process to get you through. But if it sounds like you, if you're doing seven or eight figures, you are a digital agency CEO, and you want to be an actual CEO, not someone who's stuck in the weeds doing all these things, I want to encourage you to check out the Best Damn Agency Mastermind. The best way to do that is either email my mastermind director, JJ, JJ at salesdrivenagency.com or go to www.bestdamnmastermind.com and go check it out. Apply there. You'll talk to JJ, then myself, then my counsel. If you get in, it's going to cost you, but it'll be worth it. So Best Damn Agency Mastermind, go to www.bestdamnmastermind.com. All right, brother. Thanks for letting me pitch me. Um, so let's talk about the salespeople, setting them up for success. You said you've got a team, five or six full-time salespeople. Um, there's a couple of different components of how I think about a sales operation you think very similar to me. Process, people, enablement. Mm -hmm. Let's talk first about the people because I think that's where people naturally gravitate towards. So let's at least talk about them first. Um, how do you view salespeople? What do you look for in a sales hire? And, and let's see if we differ here if we're on the same page. Yeah, so we do a couple things. We have a, well, I'll, let me just tell you our strategy from the high level up, right? Um, because I think the strategy is the key. So number one, you, you need talent acquisition in-house, right? Stop using random outside recruiters. It's very expensive. Mm. Uh, if I, I heard this, you know, this idea of a build order, right? Because you're going to, you're going to plant a field. 
well, do you buy the tractor first? Do you get the land first? What's the build order? What's the best way to do it? It's like, well, I'm going to probably buy the land. Then I'm going to clear all the trees. Then I'm going to plant the seed. Well, first, I got to get the tractor. You think about the order you want to do it in. One of the guys talked about his build order, and he said he built his first company, and recruiting was one of the later things that he built, hmm. right? And he said that was a mistake because the recruiter is literally there to find you the best people. Yep. And the seed crystal, right, if you've read Zero to One from Peter Thiel, the seed crystal is what the rest of your company is going to look like. So what if your first salespeople kind of suck because you didn't have great talent acquisition systems in place? Mm-hmm. Well, your next salespeople are probably going to suck because the, the, the ones that suck are going to teach the new ones the culture of sucking, right? It's like poultry that. strategy for breakfast, right? So I always wanted to make sure from the very beginning we had really, really, really good recruiting. So the first person you need to have internally is, is talent acquisition. Get a full-time recruiter. Because that person's job is not to get you a sales hire. It's to get you sales people down the road and to get really good ones. And you need to have three, four, five, seven people to pick from or else you don't really have choices. If you have one candidate, you don't have choices, right? Yep. Number two is we hire, we look for people who are technical and savvy digital natives, people who get our product, but who have also already sold. So you're right out of school, you came right out of college, it's not, I'm not interested. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are some sales organizations who, who do that, sure. and that's okay. But they are usually much bigger and they have really, 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 really good training processes. And we're mm-hmm. too small, we have 50 people, like we can't do that, right? Um, so we had to say, we got to hire people who already know how to swim, and then we have to bring them, here's your flippers, here's your fins, now swim all the way over there, right? Yep. So for us, it's you've got to have two to five years outside B to B hunting experience at quota. Literally identical. Qualify. Yeah, because the range I, I always give. Like, yeah, no, well, that's exactly what we do. I don't tell me, tell me why. Tell me why it stops at five. Yeah, because if you're ten years into B to B and you're not making the money that puts you way out of our range, you probably suck. Mm. So then I don't want you. If you've been doing sales for 10 years, you already have a pipeline built. You make too much for our sales job, Yep. right? Because you already have all these And you come with baggage. Baggage and bad habits, right? So our preference is somebody who is a college athlete, graduates, goes to work somewhere like a, you know, an Unum or a MetLife or whatever, where they have really, really crappy culture, but great sales training, yep. right? Someone, somewhere people don't want to work for 15 years. But they'll work for two to three to four years. They'll do quarter over quarter quota attainment. You have to. You can't work there for three years. We don't hit quota every quarter because right. you get fired. So that person leaves and they know how to prospect. They know how to hit target. They know how to hunt. We, we give them a better sales stack, a great commission plan, and a good culture. Yep. And they love it. But you don't have to teach them how to hunt. So that's that. When you think about building your sales organization, you need to think about that. And then salespeople want energy, right? Like you can't hire one salesperson, put them in a corner and give them a cell phone. I think it's going to work, right? Like right. You want to build a team. They need competition. They need energy. They want to work with other good salespeople, right? So my advice to agency owners is if you're going to do sales, like go all in, like don't, yep. don't put your toe in the water and get one dude, like go all in, man, like five, yep. 10, like hire a team because Pareto principle, like two of the, of the 10 are going to outsell everybody else. But if you only hire one, what if you hired one of the eight that don't? Right. Yep. Well, we talked about that. You have one rep who just crushes it compared to the rest. And, yeah. and I think in my, my actual philosophy has changed over the years um, where I used to, to kind of have like an even playing field. Like I want to have where the rising tide is lifting all ships when it comes to comp plans mm-hmm. and something in me over the years and whether it's experience and data points and just kind of looking at something like a Pareto principle, like at the end of the day, it is a 20, 20% is going to produce 80% of the income. I've actually decided that comp plans should be built in such a way that creates a disparity between the top and the bottom. And and that disparity kind of has a compounding effect to where I want to see my top person just shitting on the smallest person. And I don't mean that from like a cultural perspective. Like we should all want to rise everyone, but I want it to be such a way that my top performer makes so much more money than my other ones. Um, Like in sports. Sports is that way. Yeah, it is. I mean... The, those who are extreme athletes than every other person on the Lakers other than the two top players combined probably mm-hmm. right and no one cares because he's the franchise player so everyone he drives there, the right? revenue at the end of the day he drives the revenue drives the eyeballs drives the bus in the seats yep and he also happens to be really freaking good 
So I love that. And, and what's funny is I use the same range, two to five years. Two means you've been kicking the teeth enough to know sales, get what you're know what you're into, and and still be hanging around because the the churn for salespeople in their first two years of sales is so high. Uh, most people can't cut it for for more than two years. Five, I choose five because, like you said, one price range. Two, I want them to be malleable and teachable enough to where they're not coming in with a bunch of baggage and bad habits, like you mentioned. Um, and I think that also creates that when they're all kind of at two to five years, right? Like if you bring in some guy who's been 10, 15 years, 20 years in sales, yes, they bring all that stuff, but they're also used to being a lone wolf salesperson as opposed to operating in a cohesive unit. And, and again, like just despite the fact that I want disparity between top and bottom, I still want everyone to be rising in competition and fighting for one another. And if you have some guy come in, he's 15, 20 years, he's, he's outdated, he's not used to using the stack, he's not going to adopt the same thing you guys are. That one cancerous person, I don't care how good they are, if they're cancerous to my culture, cut them. So I kind of have two sides of the coin there, right? Create the disparity. But if that disparity, if that top performer is still a cancer in my organization and is pushing everyone else down, I'll still Mm -hmm. cut them despite the disparity I'm trying to create with with comp. It's super interesting. And I think my methodology and philosophy has changed over the years. I'm not opposed to that. I mean, so for me, a couple of things, and, and I always tell people about is like, I, I'm a salesperson, right? So I can rag on salespeople. Like, it's got to be simple, and it has to be able to be written on crayon on a napkin, mm-hmm. and, it, and it makes sense, right? So if your commission plan is like three, 13 pages long and weighs, you know, 12 pounds, your salespeople are, are not going to perform. They're not going to be that happy. You need to be able to sketch it on a napkin. This is how much you're going to make this year, and this is how you make money. Because salespeople like were driven by the dopamine shot of I want to make a big commission check now, right? Yep. So I want my reps. So the way we built our commission plan is super simple. When you go sell a deal, you know the minute they say yes, how much you're going to make. Yep. I want it to be super simple, right? Don't want them to have to go back and, and get a master's degree in advanced, you know, engineering to figure out what they're <laughs> going to make. Right. At the same time, I agree with you that that there should be bonuses and caps. So what we have done is everyone gets the same plan, but there's all kinds of bonuses on top when you hit 500,000 sales, 600, 700, 800 million. And so the guy who's hitting the million, 2 million, 3 million, he's making every bonus out there and all the recognition. He's loving it. And the person who's just squeaking by at 450 barely got anything, right? Yep. 100%. So that's kind of how we've done it. Because um, I have found, like, I guess one thing I'll throw out there is, is when it comes to top salespeople, there's money and money's nice, but recognition is huge for them. Huge. And so like, I think they want the $15,000 bonus check, but more than anything, getting that check in front of the rest of the team or getting the, the trophy and recognition in the company-wide meeting with yes. 60 people on Zoom, they that to them is probably honestly more valuable than the money. That's why President's so, Club exists in these big corporations. Right? Right. I, I came from that world. You came, it sounds like, similar from that world. Yeah. I was running a big sales department. It's a corporate Fortune 100 level where it was very no innovation, or at least they wouldn't let you work outside of a box too much. But it's amazing training. Comp plans are very simple. Yet when you hit a certain level, like your goal is to get to President's Club, and how many President's Clubs have you been in, right? Like, and there's no, I mean, there yes, there's bonuses attached to it, but people care about the the badge more than anything. Mm-hmm. It's insane. I mean, even if you look at like, if you look at resumes for people who are working in that corporate world, so like the ADPs, the tech systems, the Allegis groups, like all these larger organizations that have big, massive sales forces. If you look at their resume, it like the first thing to talk about is how many presidents clubs they hit, not quotas, not revenue. It's, it's how many presidents clubs they hit. Yeah. And I always look at that as it's because that's all we care about, right? We do care about the big commission checks, but you're right. Notoriety or, um, being, uh, made much of in front of other people is kind of how we're driven. Yeah. There's one other thing I want to say to all of this, which is if you think about like, l- like let's go back to the agency owner who was struggling to build a sales team. Right. Like let's talk about that. Okay? Cause I think there's a lot of those people and I've gotten those phone calls that people say, like, Tim, mm-hmm. how, how have you guys grown so fast? Right. We have a sales team, you know, like, yeah. we're not growing that fast. Like I'll tell you some companies are growing fast. Right. You know, and they're like, no, 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 no. You guys are growing fast. How do we do it? I'm like, well, and you kind of walk them back. Do you have a sales team? No, I do the sales. Well, hire a sales team. Well, it's expensive. Well, yeah, it's expensive. Of course, it's expensive. Like, so is the opportunity good. cost of not having one? <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, yes, yes, you're going to have to pay these people money. Yeah, that's salespeople aren't free. Like, they're 
they're probably the second most expensive people in your company next to executives, right? Yep. But do you want to grow or not? Do you have sales tech stacks? Do you have bonuses? Like, do you have all the stuff? But here's the, the first thing I tell everybody. So for me, my very first SEO company, I struggled to build a sales team because as a first time business owner, I could not get out of my way of I wanted to be perfect, right? Mm-hmm. Like, man, this guy, I hire this guy, he sells like half as well as me. Like, why would I give him leads? I'll close at an 85, 90% close ratio. If I give this guy leads, he closes like a 40%. This is terrible for me, right? And so I couldn't get that out of my head. So I could never find good enough salespeople. Mm-hmm. So we just we churned salespeople because I could never find ones who could sell as well as me, right? And I was always like a top sales performer everywhere I work. It's really good at sales. And so I had this limiting belief. Well, after I sold my company and, and, and we had a good exit and the company had grown, but I scaled, I never could scale sales well, even though I was a very good salesperson and I'd worked in some good sales teams. Somewhere along the way, I learned a crucial piece of advice, which is look, if you're trying to create duplication, you're not trying to replicate yourself. So if you're really good at sales, like the best person at sales, you're not going to find other people like you. You're probably rare, right? What you're trying to do is create people who are, you get them as good as they can be. Yep. But like, let's say your sales reps could sell half as well as you. So two of them could sell as well as you. You can outsell two reps, maybe three, maybe four. You can't sell up. You can't outsell 15 no. reps or 30 reps or 50 reps, right? And so what dawned on me was like, oh, if I hire three reps, like I could outsell three people. I can't outsell 30. In yeah. fact, I can't even come close to outselling 30. So the mind, the mindset shift had to be, it's not whether they can do it as well as me. It's can more of them do this consistently more than me without me there? That's true duplication. Yeah. And you don't build wealth without duplication and you don't build a big company without duplication. I love so that. it's, it's a shift in mentality of you're not trying to hire a person who can sell your product as well as you. No one's going to, you're the business owner, you know, yep. it intimately, right? You've got to find someone who can do it 30 or 40 or 50 percent of your level and then hire a whole team of those people. They'll win every time. Well, and the, and, the, and the part that we don't think about, too, is repetitions increases productivity, right? So yeah. for one, someone can't sit in the seat that you're currently occupying. So get your ass up and let them sit there. So they'll, they'll never be nearly as good as you because you won't let them. Yeah. The second sure. is... You have to be, like you said, okay with someone being 50% as good as you. One of my mentors said that. He was talking about more like delivery and fulfillment. So he was saying 70%, but salespeople, it's 50 um, or even less than that and, and to some degree. But you think about it. If, if someone goes to the gym, the basketball gym, and they start shooting free throws and they shoot 10 a day, cool. They're going to have a, they're gonna have some sort of percentage somewhere between 0 and 10 of how many of those they make. Let's just say they make 50. Let's say they make 30. 30%. Yeah. They make three of the 10. Cool. What happens if they start shooting 100 a day? Well, then they make 35 out of 100. That's a 35%. That's a 5%. And that's almost a 25% lift in their production. And then they start mm-hmm. shooting 100 every day. And now they're making 40. Now they're making 42. Now they're making 45. And eventually they climb to where they can produce as much as you or a decent proportion compared to where you are at. But now they're devoting more time to it than you can. And so I think that's the other thing too, is you as the owner have to wear 10 hats, you know, in a lot of cases, if you're still selling, you can only devote so much time to sales. And so, yes, you might produce 80% close rate. Cool, Bob. But you're only devoting five, seven hours to sales. What happens when someone can do a 25% close rate, but can devote 40 hours a week to it, right? Mm-hmm. Like at some mm-hmm. point this turns over and it's far more productive. Um, that's also my case for lead generation too, because if you can have a lot more leads in there, you, you have a lot more at bats, and you could afford to have, you know, a, a thirty percent conversion, and even then, that's high. And uh, there are people in the Hall of Fame for baseball who got on base three out of ten times, so we should be okay yeah. with that, right? Totally. Man, we could talk all day. So let's talk about some other parts. We talked about people. It's the hiring. It's the training. Um, two parts I want to talk about: enablement and process. Talk to me about process first, because I am I am a bigger believer in having rock star sales process over rock star salespeople. Do you believe yes. that as well? And if so, or if not, tell me kind of where you fall on that and, and how do you take that seriously? Yeah, okay. So um 
there was a uh, process like quote I'm trying to remember. Uh, you know, there's like it was you know culture strategy for breakfast, right? Peter Drucker. There's a process one. I can't remember. It's like left off my head, but process is critical. So when you when you think about building, buying, selling, or running a company, a company is essentially a huge smattering of little processes, mm. right? Like our marketing, our logo, it's a little process. We created this thing. It's a little IP, right? And then yep. a lead comes in and we have a process. And then we sell a deal and we have a process and we kick it off and we have a process and we start that client. We have a process. And we build them. We have a process. There's just like thousands of little processes. So at the end of the day, your company is only as good as your processes. Yep. So you have to think about that, right? <laughs> your human body, like if there are broken processes, your kidneys don't work, your legs don't work, there's processes that are broken, your body will only be as healthy as the processes you know in your body, right? Yes. So let's just think about the company and this whole idea of sales process. So um, I, I'm a huge believer in a couple of things. Number one, please, please, if you're going to sales people, do the, spend the money on, on some kind of list or, or database so yep. that your process is not your, your people with a base of 70, 80 grand a year Googling, trying to find a marketing director's name and phone number. Such a waste of time. What does that mean? Like revenue generator. An hour? Like, yeah, you can have that done. You can offshore that and have it done for six bucks an hour, not seven, not pay somebody 50 bucks an hour to do that job. That's right. Right. So you got to think about that stuff. And it's like, well, I don't want to spend 20 grand on, on Zoom info. Dude. The 20 grand, like you can't think short term, spend the 20 grand on Zoom info so you're not paying three salespeople 70 grand a year to do the same job, right? So, so focus on RGA, right? Revenue generating activities. Number two is make your process from, from opening a potential prospect to closing a lead as simple as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. Try to keep it super, super simple, right? Who is our ideal customer pro- portfolio, that, that persona? What do they look like? What, how old are they? All the demographic factors. How do you put a real face to this person so your salespeople can think about who they're going to sell to? Uh, number three, as a sales process, you as the founder, I believe, should do every process and record them and create your own video library of how to do every process perfectly so that the person did it wrong. Hey, go back and watch the video again. Go back and watch the demo, how to do the demo. Did you do ABC? Did you ban qualify? Oh, I forgot to ban qualify. Yeah, go back and watch it again. Boom. Right? Like you got to do those pieces. So get the process right. And the process should be simple, right? Hey, it's your initial outreach, then it's a discovery call, then it's a proposal meeting, then you, I know you guys do first first meeting and then commitment meeting, right? Yep. Love that. I think that's fantastic. We're probably going to borrow that and give you credit for it. You but, said. you know, we we do discovery call, proposal, proposal negotiation, close, right? Yep. But I think we can get that down to two meetings. But have that process be really simple. Um, also, one thing that I, I realized as an entrepreneur, your job is to create systems and solve problems. Employees' jobs are to execute the systems that are created. The one area that got me into trouble in the past is coming to a salesperson like, hey, can you help us develop this, this system or process? Mm. Figure this out, right? Hey, Joey, I want to build a swimming pool. Here's a spoon. Figure it out. <laughs> I'll, I'll be back in a week, right? Yeah. Then I come back and there's like a little hole dug. And, you know, I come in, I find you on LinkedIn putting up your resume. I'm like, Joey, what's going on, man? Like, oh, I start digging, there's rocks, this is hard, I don't know, I'm scared, right. I want to go work somewhere else. You're like, no, just just keep digging, come on, I get you all motivated again. What I did is I gave you a tiny tool and, and this vague a goal, and you're not an entrepreneur, you're, you're an employee, you don't want to build and create systems, you want to execute a job. And so, uh, please, as an, if you're an entrepreneur, like, co-create the system, that's your job, right? Create a system that works to give to your salespeople, don't, don't, Give them a laptop and a phone and tell them what your right. client looks like. And then here you go, man. Hope it works out. Like, don't. That guy's going to fail because that person's either an entrepreneur, which means they're going to quit and leave you and go start their own business, or they're not good at creating systems, which means they're not going to succeed. So don't don't throw them in the lurch, man. You've got to have a really clear system. Um, and, and what we do at Helium is like, hey, we're going to try stuff. It's not always going to work, right? Yeah. So we, we always try to reward and incentivize risk taking, right? We recognize when someone took a risk and it failed, not as a negative, but hey, like, not that we celebrate failure, but hey, congrats, good work. Like, you took a risk. That was fantastic. Let's try stuff, right? Let's innovate. Um, but we also try to keep the systems from changing too often. So there's a balance there, but I guess to answer your process question, that's this is our process, is we created yes. a simple sales formula from start to finish. A We have lead generation systems. We have software for each part of the, of the process. And then... Try to make it as simple as possible for people to do outreach, 
to turn those people into discovery calls, from discovery call to a proposal, from a proposal to a closed deal, and then monetarily reward them as much as possible upfront for the exact behavior that you want, i.e. closing deals. I love that. Right? Love That's it. what we do. So, so yes, process is critical, yeah. but you've got to take time to sit down and think about it and, and then build it. Yeah, we're, we're so in alignment. It's scary. So, so one thing that I have always kind of communicated this because some people say their best salesperson should become like their VP of sales or their sales leader, which is just usually a train wreck of a problem because someone who sells yeah. is not necessarily someone who could be the operator, the, the leader, trainer, manager, coach. But I, I think too, like the driver doesn't build the car, right? Those are two different people, two different skill sets. And so like you said, you should not expect your salespeople to be doing anything other than sales and revenue generation activities, right? right? And so I think that's where we fall short. And, and there's, do you have specific ways that you document processes? Because like for us, it's as simple as throw a loom on, screen record what you're doing, talk out loud while you do it, send it to a technical writer that we have as a 1099 contractor that we found on Upwork years ago that we trialed. Send it to her. She documents it all, does the pointing, the pictures, the arrows, the step-by-step, do this, 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 and this. Turns into a process. We iterate it, we iterate it, we iterate it. Make it simple, make it simple, make it simple. Boom, it's now a process. Throw it into the knowledge base. Right? Like That's how we do it. Do you guys have a specific process for developing process? Yeah, process for developing the process to build the process. That's right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, (laughs) I feel like it's an office episode. So... Uh, the way we've done it is we created a Vimeo library, a paid Vimeo library, where yes. you can save your own videos without any ads and you can you can have like a login or whatever. So we created our own LMS or learning management system in Vimeo. And then right. we had a founder go and record every step of the process. Now, I had I had an unfair advantage in that I had built sales teams and I, I, I knew how to sell products. So we started Helium, like I knew what the sales process should look like yeah. at the beginning, um, which to your point, don't start companies if you don't know how to do it well, right? <laughs> um, I agree with that. Like, make sure you are better than the competition because business is dog eat dog. Like, if you're not good, you won't survive, right? It'll be good. So, so I knew what that should look like. So it was literally from day one, here's how we're going to do a discovery call. Here's the tech we're going to use. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's how we can qualify. Now, proposal. Here's a proposal template. You do control F, you find the name, you change the name from, from ABC company to the company you're going to work on. You change these three graphs. Done. The rest is built for you. Here's a quoting template. Put in this information, done for you, right? So the whole proposal is custom, but it took you 25 minutes every time, right? Yep. So that's how we did it. So we kind of made it simple um, and, and easy in that form. Our process for creating process is everything, if you want to change process, has to be documented in writing and shared with the sales team. So yep. typically what we'll do is every process, so we use Google Drive, and we're paid Google Shop, we use uh, paid Google for everything. The enterprise version now, I think. So we have Google Drive set up as all of our folders and everything. So we have to have a sales folder with sales documentation, sales training, all the different folders yep. as well, the video library. And then all of the documentation of commission plans or the physical, like spelled out documents of how to do everything, everything is written down and put in there. Um, so we don't use an offshore writer. That's a good idea or, or someone on Upwork. It's not a bad idea. We're big enough now where we have an admin team, right? So oh, well, you can do it internally. Yay. We can do it internally. Um, but honestly, when we started, we did it ourselves. Nice. We didn't outsource it. Uh, not because I'm against outsourcing, um, but because I wanted to make sure those things were done really, really right. And so when you delegate right, it doesn't get done the same way you would do it. No. Um, it's 50% or 70% or 80%. So I didn't want to take the time to get the delegated person up to my level. So I just did it myself. Sweet. Um, but that's not it. You can use different processes there. For me, it was just... Yeah, no, I think it's awesome. I would think super similar. Uh, well, man, we've been jamming for 50 minutes now. We're probably over your time. But uh, before I get you out of here, I want to do the round of random and hit you up yeah. with uh, six questions that we ask every guest. And I'm going to have you on again because I think we could talk all day because I want to, you know, I would have jumped into enablement and talked about tech stack and stuff like that. But we'll save that for another totally. day so people can get excited about it because uh, everyone loves yeah. the shiny objects of tech stacks. Oh, yeah. um, so let's jump into round of random. First question, if you could leave where you're at right now and you could teleport and COVID is not an issue, everything is back to normal, no one's, you know, hijacked an illness and made it political and made cities shut down, 
no, that's not a political stance. That's just facts at this point. You can teleport <laughs> yeah. anywhere for an extended vacation. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh, okay. Um, Antarctica would be one option. Um, is, is one. We actually were going to take a trip to Antarctica, but then we found out my wife is pregnant and her due date is the week we would be in Antarctica. Oh, gosh. Um, so I was like, frick. Like, really wanted to do that. It's going to be teleporting makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> super easy. I kept flying <laughs> when you're like in your third trimester. So it's like, how do we even get to the boat in Patagonia? So we yeah. like, right, we're not sure. Uh, I'd say I'd say Antarctica, which is where we want to go, or Necker Island. I want to go to. Super oh, cool. Nice. Those would be two places to go. Love it. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, living, dead, past, or present, who would it be and why? Warren Buffett. Love it. Why? Um, he does. So we went to Wyoming this year. Like we took a camper out there and we went for two weeks on the way back. We stopped at Berkshire Hathaway in Omaha. And like, I followed this guy for years, right? I think he's a great investor, a great business mind. I love his story. Um, and the guy's like so unassuming, but so wealthy. Yep. It's crazy. He's, just, he's a cool guy. Really interesting guy. So, um, there's, a, I think it's the steakhouse right outside his office. There's a chop house. And if you donate, I think it's over a million dollars to his charity or his foundation that supports, I don't, I don't even know what they support, but if you over this level and you're a shareholder, once a year, he'll do dinner with those guys. Cool. And so there's people who literally will donate a million dollars to have dinner with Warren Buffett. I don't know what their goal is. Maybe it's to meet him. Maybe they're trying to get yeah, I'm sure it's also maybe. the networking of everyone else who's willing to put a million dollars in. Totally. Right. So there's got to be some ROI there. Um, or maybe it's President's Club, right? I've had dinner with Warren Buffett. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah. Um, but that just seems like such a small group of people who have done that. Uh, so I want to, I want to be in that room. I, I'm curious what those conversations are. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Warren Buffett's a, a common answer on here as it should be. Oh, interesting. As he should be. I mean, he's just, he's, he's the OG and I think his non-assuming yeah. presence is something special that we don't come across very often. All right. If you could build another business, can't be an agency. What would you build? Um, I would build, uh, one thing I, I miss or not miss, I would say, but one, one itch I have not been able to scratch is a B2C focused business. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm in B2B all day long, right? But there's a lot of stuff you can't do in B2B, a lot of advertising channels that don't work, a lot of social channels that don't work. They just don't produce because it's just not how people do B2B. Um, and B2C can get really big with, with advertising and marketing, which I love. Um, yeah. So if I had to scratch an itch right now, I would build an e-commerce focused B2C company that sold some really unique stuff. Nice. That's what I would do. Cool. Yeah. If you and I went to dinner, I'm paying. Where Sweet. are we going? Oh, man. Um, are you a foodie hmm. at all? Do you like food? I, I am. Yeah. I'm not like, I'm not one of those foodies where it's like, if it's not perfect, I won't eat it. Like, I'll no, eat anything. of course not. But you enjoy um, good food. Oh, 100%. Uh, probably... Like Chicago Chop House or Smith and Lewinsky, a, a really high-end steakhouse. I'm in Cincinnati, so there's Jeff. There's a chain called Jeff Ruby's. Like they've got four or five like really high-end steakhouses. Love it. Always, you know, lobster bisque, amazing steak. And, mm. You know, you're you're pretty inflamed for like a whole week afterwards. It's um, okay. But so worth it. Yeah, I'm going to Scottsdale next week with a mastermind, and I'll be there a couple of days early. Yeah. And I mean, with a multifamily syndicator that I've invested with. And uh, he wants to take me to, it's called Nobu, which I guess is popular in like the mm -hmm. New York and Las Vegas, or I think there's a California one too, but some high end steak restaurant pumped or steakhouse. Do it, man. That's fun. What are you irrationally passionate about outside of work? Uh, I love, I love uh, Korean video games. What? Really? Yeah. yeah. Name one. So, I, I couldn't name a single one, but. Oh, so I like for fun. Uh, I don't know how I got into this, but I'm a huge StarCraft fan, right? Okay. So I'm not, not all video games, but StarCraft, StarCraft 2. And I follow the Korean StarCraft scene. So I watch these guys play StarCraft 2. It's like there's just two English characters. Everything else is in Korean. So like they translate and everything. But these guys are ridiculously good at this game. It's all strategic. It's like real time strategies. It's economy versus army. And they build, and these dudes are so good. Like, it's unbelievable how good they have become at this game. Uh, it's very entertaining to watch, but I am un unusually passionate about Korea. So, like, once COVID stuff goes away, I'm totally going to go to Korea and, like, sit there and watch one live with my little sign. You know, like, <laughs> from Ohio. 
totally going to do that. Plus, Never I have guessed it. Ball. That is Never the most the unique video. answer. Most unique answer yeah. I've gotten. I like it. I right, work. Video. Where can people find out more about you, about helium, or can they connect? We'll link with it. We'll link to it below in the show notes. So you can Google Helium SEO. We'll pop up spot one. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. You can follow me on LinkedIn. I've, uh, I've got a pretty decent following there. Um, if you want to send me an email, it's just Tim at helium seo.com. Um, and you can go to our website. We've got all of our contact information on there. If you want to reach out and love to, you know, I'll, I'll do one meeting with just about anybody. Uh, people want to start businesses. I love those conversations. You know, people want have an agency that want to help it grow. Um, you know, and uh, companies that say, hey, man, we need better SEO, uh, as well as agencies who say we have a crappy SEO partner, right? Like we're not getting the results we need, but like something better. You know, that's yep. who we'd love to talk to. Love it, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. This was so fun for me because we get to talk sales. I don't get to do that this in depth that often. One day I'm going to yeah. convince you to join my mastermind because I just want you in there. Um, humbled, thankful. Thanks for giving us your time. Thanks for giving us your wisdom. I'm definitely going to have you on again. We'll chop it up and we'll go into the enablement stuff and maybe some other nerdy things we could talk about. Totally, man. I think I think a couple things. No, I'm happy to join, man. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. I love, I love doing these things. I speak of that's my favorite. Um, I think uh, a couple things we're like learning and digging into. So we're, we're you know, growing our sales team. I think um, selling geographically focused versus mm-hmm. like, so in person, now coming as COVID stuff goes away. Selling in person versus selling remotely, like in the world of Zoom, that's an interesting one because it's like, what's the what's the new normal? What's the better? Yeah. Um, cold email also, we, as we've been digging into, like we do a lot of cold emailing. Cold emailing is getting very, very crowded and competitive. Yeah. Um, and and Google is like really, I mean, essentially Google is trying to kill cold emailing because they want to oh, yeah. ads. Yeah, we have to have our, we have our own tactics for getting past that for now, but Google will get smart like always. Right. So like that's that's some interesting stuff. I'd love to talk through and, and get your take on that, because that's something right now we're trying to plow through is like, all right, what's the future of that? Because we today I think we need to up our game on the on the cold email side. So yep. I mean, those will all be interesting topics. I'd love to chat through on a webinar. Yeah, let's do it. Because I think tactic dependence will kill a sales team, um, just like salesperson dependence if you have no process or framework for them to operate within. You just go hire a salesperson that happens to be good and you find a diamond in the rough. Yep. You're dependent on the yep. salesperson. They leave you. You go to zero. Same thing with tactics. You get so honed in on one tactic to grow and it goes away. Boom. You lose it and you go back to zero. So, That's no, it. man, I love talking that game. Happy to do it. Uh, Tim, thank you, brother. Thank you for coming Absolutely, on. Man. Great to Look see you, man. Thanks. Likewise. And thank you guys for listening to the Best Name Agency podcast. Uh, please go subscribe, rate, do all the things that make me happy and warm inside. I don't uh, pitch other people's shit on here because I want to keep it free for you guys to be valuable. All I ask in return is that you pay me with your attention. And I thank you for doing that. So give us ratings, subscribes. Uh, go check us out on YouTube if you're not watching this here yet. We just kind of launched it. So we're still small on YouTube. Make me feel good with my numbers and vanity metrics. See you guys.